Welcome to No Tourists Allowed, a podcast where two recognized travel industry executives with a combined 69 years on the inside of travel and technology give up their secrets to the thing everyone wants to do. Travel better, pay less, and see more of the world. Enjoy today's episode. Good day. I'm Mike Putman. And I'm James Ferrara. And Mike, we have several spicy things we're going to cover on today's episode. Uh, And I am coming to you live from wine country in Sonoma, California, at the historic Sonoma Mission Inn. I'm sitting by the fireplace in my beautiful Spanish colonial style, uh, Spanish mission style room. Uh, it is spectacular weather, spectacular grounds, and we might be doing a little wine tasting while I'm here. Oh, I'm jealous now. I am jealous. <laughs> uh, actually, last night we had a dinner in the caves of the Gloria Ferrer sparkling wine uh, winery and vineyards. Uh, the day before, we were at Sebastiani for a lunch in the barrel room with these incredible uh, historic wine barrels. And then one of um, the largest barrels in the world, actually together with its two sisters in Europe, they are the three largest barrels in the world. And it's about two and a half stories high wooden barrel that, um, you know, in my fantasies, uh, you could jump into and have a little swim. (laughs) Yeah, I'll tell you what a what a rough job you got, James. Um it's a tough job someone's got to do it. Um Mike, right. maybe the spiciest portion of our episode today is actually our very special guest. So I'd like to get right to it. And yeah, uh, let's do. Yeah, let's we have do. a gentleman, uh, a a friend of both Mike's and mine. We were all three of us together very recently in Northern Ireland. Uh, also a wonderful travel experience, which we've shared with you. Uh, he is a journalist for 40 years in the travel industry and elsewhere, but uh, a known leader in uh, publishing and journalism in travel. He's led uh, one of the top publications in the trade, so to uh, travel industry professionals, and that's called Travel Mole in both the UK and the US. Uh, He's been involved in various uh, organizations in both places. Uh, If he doesn't actually have dual citizenship, we're going to grant him uh, honorary dual (laughs) citizenship because he spends a lot of time uh, over here in the States. In fact, he's here now. Uh, And uh, he also... It has been very active, was a director uh, of an organization that he helped found uh, called ResponsibleTravel.com. And uh, we've had conversations uh, about responsible tourism, thoughtful travel, sustainability, and we're going to touch on that today, a critically important topic. And, um, you know, we're lucky to have someone of his uh, knowledge in that area and passion uh, to share with us. So please welcome from Travel Mole and so much more, Graham McKenzie. Yes, welcome, Graham. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, Thank you for inviting me on. I appreciate it. So Graham, you're in the U.S. Uh, Where exactly in the U.S. are you today? Uh, Today, I'm in the capital of Alabama. I'm in Montgomery. Uh, I have been to see... Uh, the Alabama Shakespeare Festival, which, uh, t- despite its name, is actually a, a magnificent theatre complex uh, just outside Montgomery. And uh, I've been to the Montgomery Art Museum, and I have just been. I'm literally hot-footed back from the Hank Williams Museum. <laughs> oh, I love Hank Williams. There you go. I didn't realise that Hank Williams died so young and died so tragically in the back of a Cadillac on his way to a New Year's Day concert in Akron, I think it was Akron. Anyway, somewhere in Ohio. Oh, yes, yes. Mike, we went to see (laughs) a country music stars museum together in Nashville, didn't we? 
sort of the thing to do. Yeah, John, Johnny Cash, that's right, uh, was a fantastic museum. And I definitely suggest anyone visiting Nashville spend uh, two or three hours at the Johnny Cash Museum, which is located um, right in the middle of, of all the attractions. So, And I just yeah, we'll, added Hank Williams to my list. Next trip to Alabama. Well, Graham, we really do appreciate you uh, joining uh, and, um, what we do with our guest in the beginning usually is we give you, um, some quick questions, uh, just so our listeners can learn a little bit more about you and your travel habits and styles. Um, mm-hmm. and we'll, we might do that. And if you'll just give us kind of a one word or short phrase answer to these, we'll go through these relatively quickly. Okay. Um, so Graham, what is your favorite hotel brand or individual property? My favorite individual property would probably be the Broadmoor in Colorado Springs. Nice. And do you have a favorite brand as well? Um, I quite like uh, the Moxie Marriott. It might, I might seem a bit old in the two for that, but I quite like that. I like their <laughs> Graham, chill out dude. <laughs> we are outside the target profile for that. Oh, I appreciate that, but it just shows how young at heart I am, James. Yes, uh, true. Probably. You, You've probably seen that from my dancing when uh, when we're in Belfast. But, uh. Now, Moxies have um, sometimes tattoo parlors in the lobby and and sort of funky barber shops. It's a really cool, young, hip, big bar in the lobby kind of brand, right? Yeah, it is. I think if you go in there um, with the right mindset, um, if you're in the baby boom generation, which I am, then I think it's a good thing because it's chilled out. People are very friendly. It's relaxed. It's not stuffy. The quality of the restaurants and the quality of the service that I've enjoyed in the Moxies when I've stayed there has been very good. And the rooms are fairly basic uh, and functional. Suits me. I don't need anything fancy. But I think the general vibe is nice. I like it. I mean, the first one I went to was South Beach, Miami. Lovely rooftop bar, um, rooftop chill-out zone, looking across South Beach, out into the Atlantic, summer breeze coming in. Nice. What not to like. Right. So, Graham, of, of your 40-plus years' experience, what would you say your favorite destination is? Scotland. Anywhere particular in Scotland? West coast of Scotland. Oh, okay. Why uh, and why is that, might I ask? Well, I think there's a couple of things. I think that you go up there, you get a very warm welcome, which is nice. And tourism, in my opinion, is all about service and the people you meet and the stories and, oh, you know, it's a combination of things. But those things are extremely good. The food is exceptional, uh, seafood in particular. And you just, there's a feeling of, I suppose, remoteness. Uh, there's a feeling that you're almost on the edge of the old world, coming from the new world into the old world. And I like that. And I suppose, although I've never really had any de- direct experience, my heritage, uh, my name's Mackenzie, my heritage is Scottish. And so I've, I, I, I feel at home there. And it's dramatic scenery. The wildlife's really good. I'm not sure I would necessarily want to go there if I was a 19-year-old, um, but now I would definitely say that's – and those contributory factors also determine where other places that I enjoy, that and history and heritage. You know, yeah. At the, risk of, uh, at the risk of sounding like a Johnny One Note, the food's also good there. <laughs> the food is excellent there. I mean, the food is absolutely excellent. And if you like – if you like uh, Game. whiskey, yeah, if you like whiskey um, and you can just sit in a big armchair by a big log fire and contemplate the various qualities of peaty, smoky Lagavulin oh. versus a Highland malt and things of that nature. And it's just really, really nice. I like it. And then the next day, even if the weather's not really good, you can get out amongst it. There's an exceptional cruise line there. Um, and it's uh, well, the main ship is the Hebridean Princess, and that basically spends most of the from about March until October, I think maybe November even, uh, 
just cruising around the the Western Isles of Scotland and and hugging the western uh, coast of Scotland. And you can go to Rum and you can go to Arran and you can go to uh, there's all sorts of smaller islands you can go to and get. A, it's just really nice. It, uh, it's not a cheap experience going on the Hebridean Express, um, so, Hebridean Princess, but it's very worthwhile. That's the second note I'm making, and we're only at the beginning of the <laughs> interview. So we ask, um, it's a tradition. Can I call it a tradition, Mike? We're only doing this for a couple of months so far, but uh, yes. we we. Ask our guests, because it is the ethos of our podcast, um, we ask them to share a tip, a hack, um, something that you do that helps your travel through the airport go easier or something that you do when you arrive at a destination or first at the hotel, anything that would help our listeners make their travels better would you be willing to share something with us for me absolutely um it's a relatively modern innovation i haven't had it all all my life but make sure your phone has got some good music on and make sure you've got some earphones bluetooth and that can exclude an awful lot of annoyances when you're on a flight or at your an airport i'm privileged enough because i fly a lot to get access to lounges but I know what life is like outside the lounge, and it can be bloody annoying, particularly if you have a delay. Um, so I try and exclude the rest of the world by just putting on music and listening to that and maybe listening to radio, local radio, if I can. It's not a particularly revolutionary tip, but yeah. that's what I do. No, I think it's a good – it's very personal, and uh, I think our listeners will really appreciate it. Yeah, that is that is a good tip. Um and, you know, I've got some of the noise counts canceling earphones, but just having those and just hearing kind of white noise is kind of boring. So uh, I, I tend to agree with Graham on that tip. Graham, thinking about all your vast experience uh, in writing for – and Travel Mole for our listeners is a travel trade magazine, one of the leading tra- uh, travel trade magazines in the world or, or periodicals. Um, but thinking about your experience – um, and all the years that you've been doing it, uh, even though you stay in Moxie hotels, um, what is the, <laughs> what is the most memorable story that you've ever reported upon? That's a good question. Um, I would say, um, I was, I suppose for me, it was fairly recent And it plays to my age a little bit. And that I was in Ybor City in Tampa. And I was given being given a guided tour of Ybor City, its history, about the uh, immigrants, the Italian and mainly Cuban immigrants, uh, to for Mr. Ybor to reclaim the capital of cigar making and how that diminished. And bringing it up to modern times was the influence of organized crime and the potential influence that had on the destiny of the presidency of the United States of America and how uh, Santo Traficante apparently stood up in an Italian restaurant on November the 18th, 1963, which was four days before my eighth birthday and was supposed to have a meeting with President Kennedy to go over various things that they had to discuss. Um, and President Kennedy didn't turn up, and Santo Traficante apparently stood up in the restaurant and said that MF is dead in a very public way, in a very public Italian restaurant, and stormed out. And then two, four days later, uh, the president was assassinated in Dallas. I found that really, really, really interesting. I mean, I think Tampa is a great place, but that just added a whole new level to my interest in Tampa, and I reported and wrote a little bit about that earlier this year. And, yeah, that I would think that's the one that's had most resonance with me. And probably if I can have another one, also this year, I went to Muscle Shoals in northeast Alabama mm. and went to the Muscle Shoals Sound Studio and was told about the history there, about that one afternoon in 
April 1969, 6.30 in the evening, bang on the door, Rolling Stones are at the door. They'd driven all the way from Miami, and that evening they recorded and and committed to tape Brown Sugar, which was later a track on their Sticky Fingers album. And the song track of my life was recorded in Muscle Shoals, Alabama, and I don't think anybody outside Alabama has ever even heard of Muscle Shoals. There is a wonderful documentary film called Muscle Shoals. It, it has not gotten any sort of wide audience or release, but it talks about the musicians who became the backbone of that studio and then yeah. it, and they influenced the Swampers. Yeah. The Swampers, yeah. And they influenced the major recording stars who came to play there. So I, that's a really cool story for you to bring up. Thank you. Yeah, it was fantastic. I mean, further down the road, there's a uh, another recording studio called Fame where Etta James and Leonard Skinner and all sorts of other oh. people recorded there. But for me, this little, almost like a little hut in the middle of nowhere, and it was so well-known amongst musicians, these uh, – the Swampers had such a high reputation that the Rolling Stones drove all the way from Miami and recorded not that track, not only that track, but in the morning they came back and Keith Richards wrote there in the studio Wild Horses and they recorded that in the – it was just – I found it difficult to take it all in, quite frankly. Yeah. It was amazing. Wow, that that is amazing. So those stories had resonance with you. What do you think are the stories that had the most resonance with readers? What were your, what was your most popular story, the biggest news story that you ever wrote? Again, pretty good, pretty good question. I suppose that I've done interviews, video interviews I've probably had more recently, you know, um, in the last, you know, well, we've been doing it for 10 or 15 years now. And I did one with, um, I did one with famous cricketer in the in the Caribbean called Sir Vivian Richards. He's a knight of the realm, and we just spoke about his life coming being brought up in Antigua and how poor he was and how he made his way because of cricket, but how much he appreciated what his country had done for him and what his family had done for him, and indeed what cricket had done for him, and he'd never forgotten it. And given that he's probably one of the top. Th- most, you know, he's in the top five famous, most famous cricketers ever born. The man is so down to earth. He's so friendly. And that was really popular. I mean, that got a lot of hits, a lot of reads, a lot of views. I mean, I wrote a supplementary story with it. And when you go to Antigua, the man is, you know, he's, you can meet him in the street and he's just like an ordinary bloke. But he, as I said, he's, it's like, it's like meeting, I don't know. Try, you know, uh, I'm trying to think of the famous quarterback for the Green Green Bay Packers. Um, oh, Brett Favre or someone like yeah, that. Yeah, it's like meeting Brett Favre in the street and him being just like an ordinary chap and being down to earth. He may well be. I've never met Brett Favre, but it's that type of thing. Um, yeah. And Vivian Richards was great. And it was related to tourism, why we should be going to Antigua, what's so great about it. And there are some fantastic, you know, a beach for every day of the year, a fantastic restaurant just outside St. John's called Papa Zook's, where the guy tells you what you're going to eat rather than the other way around. <laughs> um, you know, it's just, it's a really, really, uh, Antigua and Barbuda is a fantastic place to go. And the fact that there's chaps like Vivian Richards, Sir Vivian Richards, who are around, who are just ordinary guys, is more power to their elbow, I would say. Well, I'd say it's pretty life affirming that your most popular story has to do with gratefulness and humility and and you know because <clears throat> we can be cynical and think that the most popular stories are about, you know, train wrecks. So I'm really yeah, I would hear that. Uh, to be honest, the most popular story ever written on Travel Mall has been about air, airline crashes. You know, the Air Berlin flight that crashed into the Alps. That's easily the most read story we've ever we've ever put out on on our website. Um, but for me personally, that's the one that that has been I'm probably best known for. Put it that way. So, Graham, I'm sure you've interviewed hundreds of, or thousands of people. Uh, who would be the most 
who would be the oddest person you've ever interviewed? Hmm. These are these are not easy questions. <laughs> um, the oddest person, and you're not allowed to say me, Grant. <laughs> just to be clear. <laughs> well, you're in the top three. <laughs> um, yeah, I've interviewed I've interviewed people that um, the oddest person is um, you know, from Greece, from an airline in Greece. And I was talking to interviewing him at World Travel Market. And beforehand, I said, look, this is a video interview. Um, you need to keep your answers short and sweet. And because other people would just get bored with it and they will switch off. And he said, yeah, of course, I know. I've done these hundreds of times. And proceeded to answer the first question with a, like a 15-minute diatribe about his <laughs> airline, yeah. by which time the camera had been shut off I'd walked away, and the guy was still thinking that we were recording it. <laughs> it was just awful, and I've never seen him again, and I don't suppose he's got very high regard for me either. <laughs> um, but that was the weirdest one. I mean, the, the guy, had, he'd lost something there. I don't know what the hell it was. He spoke very good English, but he just went on and on and on. There is also a famous uh, minister of tourism in the Caribbean who speaks so much within travel mole circles we've used his name as another word for verbose <laughs> yeah oh yeah. yeah some of those yeah. guys I've, I've seen some of those guys from the caribbean I, I think it's a cultural thing some of them speak like ministers you know and they have a, a cadence and a a big presentation and it's quite florid the way they speak. Well, they often put big pauses in between, in, within a sentence to almost emphasize the importance of what they're saying. Uh, and that's that's a cultural thing, I think. But I think you're right. But I think a lot of their presentation skills, indeed, you're quite right, are derived from the church. Yeah, yeah. Um, Graham, you know, there's speaking of cricketer, there is a cricketer from Australia, quite well known, whose name is Graham McKenzie. Is that you? I wish it was. I wish it was. His 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 nickname was Garth. Yeah. He played for Australia and he played for Queensland and he played for Leicester in Leicestershire in in the United Kingdom. He took loads and loads of uh, test match wickets. Uh he is probably about 25 years older than me. I think he's still alive. Mm. Um, but he was a fantastic bowler. Yeah. His action was so smooth. Uh, and he could swing the ball, you know. I know, you know, he had a fast ball. He had a uh, he had all, you know, in, t in baseball parlance, he had everything. Um, he he was a great great bowler. Yes. Yeah. Well, I know you've have you have many accomplishments. So I was just checking. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah. quite. <laughs> so Graham, uh, uh, sorry, Graham, what is? Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Uh, so uh, as you think about the travel industry, and you've seen so much that's happened, and there's been so much evolution in the business. You know, as of today, what would you say the travel industry is doing right? I think what the travel industry is moving towards, and I think they lost it a little bit, is they're moving towards the quality of the experience that you're going to get when you go on vacation or on holiday. And I think people lost that a little bit. And I see that particularly in destination marketing, where the quality of the experience you're going to get in a destination is important and as important, if not more important, than just pure numbers. And I'll give you an example. Um, I come to IPW, which is International Powwow, each year, and I've been coming for a number of years. When I first came here, you would go to a press conference and the president or the CEO or whoever it might be from a destination or from a hotel group or whatever, all they would talk about was numbers how many new hotels they built, how many more bedrooms they got, how many bed spaces they got, uh, how many visitors they'd had. And you don't hear that so much anymore. What you hear more about is about how they're integrating with the community, how resident sentiment is more important than almost anything now. Now, that may, I think, um, COVID bizarrely helped in that movement towards that. And I think that that is an important aspect because at the end of the day, if it's no good for the citizens, what's the point of tourism? Is it purely to line the pockets of some distant shareholder or owner 
or is it to actually make the lives of the citizens better? And I think if it's to make the life of the citizens better, then you're going to enjoy a much, much better vacation because you're going to get a better welcome, you're going to get better service, and you're going to get a more authentic and unique experience than if you just get a, a, a cookie-cutter experience. And what, you, what people don't want to do, what I don't want to do, is to go to a clone destination. I don't want to go where everything's the same. The food, uh, the hotel room, uh, the shops, the food you're served, everything. If that's all the same, then you start to wonder why why you're going on vacation. And in Europe, we suffered from that a great deal with some of the Mediterranean countries. They're moving away from that quite rapidly. And here in the States, you should talk to any destination marketeer and that's what they'll be talking about. And even big branded hotels are now trying to make themselves more local. I'll give an example, the Moxie, Miami South Beach. You wouldn't know it was owned by Marriott. You would think it was an independently owned hotel, local people working in it, local product, local language, if you like, uh, local, all sorts of things, local references. And I think that's a good thing. And I would say the travel industry is moving towards that rapidly in a good way. And that's a lot about what we uh, – about what this podcast is about, is having a real experience, a local experience, and um, very refreshing to hear you say that and for that to be your point of view. Um, but let's flip the coin on the other side. What do you think the travel industry is doing wrong? Well, I think there's a long way to go for even environmental sustainability to be achieved I'm always, I'll be frank with you, I'm always disappointed when I come to North America about the ease of which single-use plastics are used by the disregard for use of water, the disregard for use of energy, um, the still the persistent use of plastic cutlery, the persistent use of overuse you know almost to the point of wastage and that's i find that surprising and and every since i've been coming here i remember i I look on the television you see adverts less so now actually post covid but you see commercials for cars and they're whooping it up that you can get 20 miles to the gallon out of this car well you'd be laughed out of the street in europe if you said you got 20 miles to the gallon you know rolls royce gets 20 men 20 miles to the gallon what you'd be looking for is 50 or 60 miles to the gallon. And that I think that is related to travel. Um, and that, that sort of culture is disappointing in terms of environmental sustainability. How many times have you been into a hotel and you say, look, I don't want the – I don't want the uh, – it's probably better post-COVID, but I don't want the towels changed. I don't want the sheets changed. I'm only here for one night or two nights. Christ, I wouldn't do that at home. Why would I want it here? Yet sure enough, you come in the morning – and it's new towels, and someone's changed the bed and put new soap containers in there, and it's just wasteful. So I think there's a long way to go there, and I think there's still a long way to go to make sure that the benefit of tourism is kept in the local economy. There's a long, long way to go for that. And I Graham, think you, were in, you were in the headlines yourself um, about an event. Where was it? Was it Jamaica? Someplace in the Caribbean. Yes, I think I remember the Jamaican one. Yeah, I'll give you an example. We were at a, uh, I was at a conference in Jamaica where we were talking about sustainability and making sure that, you know, you get an authentic experience when you're in the Caribbean. And, again, you know, we all the, all the delegates, in particular the press, are given this big bag of giveaways, and they're all made in Taiwan, and they're all plastic, and the plastic was covered in – was plastic was in a plastic bag. And so I asked the minister, you know, you're you're preaching this on stage. What the hell are you doing with this? You know, it's a plastic bag within a plastic bag within a plastic bag that's come all the way from Taiwan. I don't I don't understand. There surely must be someone in Jamaica or in the Caribbean that could make something authentic that would be useful. I mean, I I must have had I not given them away or refused them. Uh, a conservative estimate would be, say, 90 water bottles that yeah. I've been given. Yeah. Right. Made out of plastic. Made out, Majority made out of plastic. Not all, but the majority. Appreciate that it saves water, even if they're made out of plastic. But, yeah. you know, 
it's there's a long way to go until we get there. And of course, you're talking about people think that if I offset my carbon, then I'm a good boy. Well, yeah, it does something, but a lot of that is just bullshit. We've got to reduce the amount of carbon we use, including flights. You know, you've got to stay longer, fly less, stay longer. Yeah, I don't think most travelers, our audience included, understand the full breadth of options they have, the choices they can make that can help improve this area where you think the travel industry is is doing things wrong. And, and it includes, you know, buying local, it includes uh, avoiding single use plastics. <clears throat> but you and I have also talked about, you know, sort of cultural uh, conservation, cultural sustainability. And I think that's a really important point you make about these bags being made, you know, halfway across the world and all of the carbon that takes to get those bags, you know, to the location on top of it. So these are just things we need to think about. Yeah, I think. And cultural sustainability is not an easy thing to achieve, actually. I think it's with environmental sustainability, it's a science. You know, you either do it or you don't. With cultural sustainability, it's a little bit more difficult. And what measures do you put in place? For example, in France, at some point, they said, right, we're not going to have any menus in English. We're not going to speak English in certain places. You know, is that is that the right way to go about it? I'm not sure, but it's one way. I mean, I would hate to go to France and not be confronted by the challenge of saying, Bonjour du baguette, you know, I would, uh, you know, I think as part of the holiday experience. So it's an interesting one, I think, but it's one worth preserving for the reasons I mentioned earlier. Because if it's not preserving, then all you're going to do is have clone destinations and climate, you know, the old days of, right, we're going to go on holiday from the UK to Spain because the climate's better. Uh, It doesn't hold water anymore when we're suffering 40 degree centigrade summers. You know, you're not going to do that anymore. Just to, in fact, you might do the opposite. You might go to further up north to get away from those. And that's an interesting aspect that might happen over the next 20 years, that you might go to destinations to get away from the heat. Well, another choice that travelers can make is to spread that footprint, right? Instead of yeah. everyone flocking to Florence, Venice, Rome, you know, there are incredible places in Italy. And now with our with resources available to us on the internet, with the way people share their experiences on social media, it's no longer hard to identify these places. With, of course, good travel professionals to support you, you you can go and have a better experience in a less trodden place, and it's ultimately better for the planet and for the culture. Yeah. Yeah, Definitely. So, Graham, uh, tell uh, tell our listeners a little bit mo- more about some of the other projects you're working on, um, other um, publications you're involved with. Yeah, I'm. Um, I write occasionally for a woman's magazine in the UK called Best, uh, which is a weekly magazine, and it's owned by uh, Hearst Empire. I'm developing a relationship with an organisation called Silver Traveller. Uh, and it does what it says on the tin. It's aiming at silver travel market. Um, I'm a great believer and that silver travelers want to remain active physically and mentally, um, that they don't just want to go and do the waltz on a cruise like my mum and dad might have done. I mean, I think people that are in their late 50s and 60s and 70s now are a different breed uh, than the post-war generation. We were talking about a baby boom generation there. You know, want to go cycling and want to go kayaking and so on. So that's some of those. And the final one, which is more recent, um, which is the one I'm delighted, I'm over the moon about, is I'm going to be doing a little bit of writing for Golf News in the UK. Um, awesome. So that's that's the ones I'm working on. Um, but I think, as James mentioned earlier, you know, I, my even with – even with golf courses, there's a lot of work to be done on sustainability. When you go around a golf course and you see single-use plastic cups, uh, you see plastic tees, 
for example, in Estonia, where you play golf, they ban plastic tees um, because animals can come along and they see brightly coloured tees and they might eat them and then die. And we don't want that. So there's all sorts of things that, you know, wherever I go, I'm looking at those aspects. And golf is no different. And I played at a place called the Peninsula Club at Gulf Shores, Alabama at the weekend. Played 27 holes as well. Um, but to go around it, it was f- from a wildlife perspective it was absolutely marvelous i mean it's fantastic you know it sounds ridiculous but it was a f- fabulous amount of insects which will attract birds uh, there was alligators there were bald eagles it was just it was excellent you know yeah yeah i played like crap but uh, the rest <laughs> of it was really good yeah i've had the opportunity to play there as well such a such a nice place. Well, Graham, you have been. I know you've got a you've got to catch a flight or or move on to your next destination. So, uh, James and I really appreciate um, you coming on the podcast and sharing some of your experiences with us. And uh, you're a great friend, and uh, we hope to have you back real soon. Lovely. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you, Graham. Cheers, James. See you soon. Well, that was great having uh, Graham in from Alabama, and luckily, we also have Miss Jessica Deverson with us again this week, who is going to bring us some of the great specials and values that she's been able to dig up over the last seven days. So welcome, Jessica. Our deal guru. Our Yay. <laughs> hey, I, guys, get in, I, I get in trouble. I get in trouble when I call her the deal diva. So I've just kind of laid off of all the branding other than just. <laughs> I was, was going to say, you got to work on your synonyms, right? Just think, keep <laughs> yeah. going. Um, also, I was just wondering, like, at what point I get like a theme song or like a walk on song. So keep that in mind. Oh, boy. <laughs> we'll, have to get, uh, we'll have to get our producer, Nathaniel, to work on that for us. But, uh, yes, that can be arranged. All right, great. <laughs> well, thanks for having me again. So I'll just get right to it. Uh, we have three great offers today that I wanted to share with you. And the first is Carnival Cruise Line. Um, everyone's familiar with Carnival Cruise Line. Uh, you know, they're known as the fun ships. You know, you come as you are and you do what you want and it's all, always a good time. Um, but right now there's an exclusive sale with Carnival um, for on Carnival Cruise Line, but um, it's exclusively an Intelli- at Intelli- travel. So um, that's actually the agency I work for, the travel company I work with. Um, and I usually say book with a travel advisor, any travel advisor, but this is actually specific to IntelliTravel. Um, so right now there's an exclusive sale and uh, it includes early saver rates, which are really great low rates. You'll also get 50% reduced deposits and you'll receive up to $50 onboard credit. And um, this is available on nearly any sailing from 2023 forward. So good deal, really good, great low rates, plus the extra onboard credit. And it's available on nearly every sailing from, like I said, January 2023 forward. And you have um, until the end of November to book. So it's actually a really great booking window. Um, Good time to get your Carnival Cruises booked from, you know, for next year, for the year after, the year after that. So good. To, and good there after. are some amazing new Carnival ships, by the way. Incredible high technology, you know, um, mega ships that Carnival has put out the last year or two and also coming this year. In fact, I'm doing the sale out of the new Carnival celebration in Helsinki, Finland. I'm going to the actual shipyard to see the ship finished, and then we're sailing her for the first time. It's not even a maiden voyage because it's not open to the public. We're sailing to Southampton, England, with just a handful of us on board this four or 5,000 passenger ship. Carnival, it's not your, your father's carnival, right? It's a new brand with new hardware, new ships, and still that great fun. So uh, I think that's an amazing offer for all of next year like that. And, and Carnival must be doing something right. I'm uh, In the background, I'm looking at my ticker screen, and their stock is up 11% today. So maybe it's just Jessica's uh, announcing this deal. But <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a great day to sell or buy Carnival stock. Think market. <laughs> 
All right. So, uh, yeah, Carnival has lots of great things coming and all those new ships, all of those um, apply to the offer as well. All, brand new ships. So, yeah, really great offer uh, for Carnival. Um, next up, uh, you know, you guys were talking sustainability and, you know, responsible travel and that sort of thing. And it's a huge trend in travel. Um, you know, 87 percent of people say they care about traveling sustainably. And uh, more and more you're seeing um, people or travelers choosing travel agents and travel companies that align with their values and those values being sustainable, responsible, ethical, you know, travel. And one brand that um, that does this well is African Travel. And so this is one of the longest established luxury safari operators exclusively focused on Africa. And um, they're highly awarded, including, you know, travel and leisure awards for best safari. Triple uh, A um, has voted them best in member services. So that's just a few, but their team has lived and traveled extensively throughout the continent. So they're really knowledgeable, really passionate about the product. Um, and their experts have over 300 years experience combined selling luxury travel. So they're able to provide five-star service every step of the way. And um, they just came out with some new sustainable journeys, a handful of journeys that are sus- considered you know, sustainable because they really understand that tourism is the lifeblood in Africa and, you know, every dollar makes a difference. And African travel, they want to guide everybody, you know, to the best, most ethically responsible and engaging experiences. And their new tours feature what they call make travel matter experiences. And so these are experiences featured on each trip and helps to, um, uh, aid Africa's wildlife and communities. And so you'll leave knowing that you made a positive, positive impact. Um, and you really will be, you know, making travel matter during those experiences. So right now they actually have six safaris on sale anywhere from nine to 12 days, but they're running a really great special on one of their top safaris called South Africa at leisure. And it's 10 days from 5599 per person, 5,599 per person for 10 days. And if you've been on safaris, you know, they're quite pricey. So 10 days from, you know, under 5,600 is a great deal. And you'll check out um, South Africa voted one of, or uh, Cape Town, South Africa voted one of the world's most beautiful cities and the coast and the winelands and the culture and the waterfront. Um, you'll go to the peninsula, you'll take a cable car to the top of a mountain. Um, you'll visit Robin Island where Nelson Mandela was imprisoned. Um, and then you'll actually spend your journey to uh, the Shamori game reserve and you'll have close encounters with the big five. So that includes lions, leopards, buffalo, elephant, and rhino. So really amazing um, safari. And then their Make Travel Matter experience on that safari or on that trip, um, you'll actually have an immersive culinary and cultural experience at Gold Restaurant. And you'll learn about all the groundbreaking work they do with the wildlife at the private reserve. So really cool experience, really great travel company. And then, you know, also doing their part to make travel matter and to be sustainable and travel, um, you know, ethically and responsibly. Is, and then uh, next is, part, up, is part of that sustainability yeah. that uh, you eat the animals in the restaurant there on site? Yeah. No. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's sustainable. Are, I mean, why would you waste the meat, right, if they happen to, to die? <laughs> you know what? Yeah. You're banned from Africa now, so. Yeah. Oh, that sounds like an amazing trip. And it's actually, that's the next big trip I'm planning for my family at African Safari. And I actually am doing it with African Travel. And, um, you know, they're just a really trusted luxury brand. Great choice, Jessica. Thank you. Yes. Um, And, you know, if... um you know, you need a plus one on the safari. I'll, I'll come with. <laughs> Don't bring Mike. He'll he'll eat the animals. Um, so, and then last but not least, uh, so keeping with the you know sustainability responsibility um, theme, um, we have G Adventures, and so G Adventures is a really great travel company. You know, their act they, their goal is to change the world through travel, and that's been their goal since they opened their doors in 1990. And that's kind of a, you know that idea is at the heart of everything they do, and it has actually helped them grow into one of the biggest adventure travel companies in the world. So. 
G Adventures believes that travel can help local communities, indigenous people, uh, women, youth, really anyone who has or any group who has been traditionally marginalized or undervalued. And so, um, you know, community tourism means that everything that they do, they believe that everything they do um, doesn't just impact the communities that they visit, but just ripples far beyond, uh, you know, just the locally that, you know, the places they visit, but, you know, those impacts are go far beyond that. And so they built their company to support local communities and they create their tours by building meaningful relationships with local communities, directly benefiting the people and the places that their trips visit. And then when you travel with G Adventures, you'll experience this firsthand. You'll, you'll, you'll really experience their commitment to making travel a force for good, a force for the better. And a perfect illustration of that would actually be their partnership with Planetara, which is the leading nonprofit, um, com- or the leading nonprofit that uses community travel and community tourism to change lives. And so, um, you know, tourism is an eight trillion dollar global industry, but many local businesses and communities don't actually benefit from the travel and the tourism in their area. There are some forms of tourism where no money reaches the hands of the local people, and so Planetara. Planetara really works to break that cycle by supporting and uplifting community tourism and strengthening community tourism around the world, building economic opportunities, you know, places become protected, cultures are celebrated. So it's a really great relationship G Adventures has with Planetara. And, you know, uh, they're just, again, G Adventures is always looking to do their part to change the world for the better through travel. And so right now they actually have some last minute travel offers. So if you're able to travel from now until the end of the year, um, they have last minute travel deals. So really, um, really uh, great low, low rates on over 130 tours for the remaining, the remainder of 2022. So you'll see trips, um, you know, you'll hear about three trips, uh, excuse me, trips that are three days, uh, starting at only $172, all the way up to 40-day trips through, you know, eight countries in Africa, complete with safaris and waterfalls and, you know, 30-day trips, 35-day trips through Southeast Asia and that sort of thing. So, uh, any, like I said, anywhere from three days to 40 days and everything in between. But if you're able to travel in 2022, you can get some really amazing low rates on these trips and you just have to call your travel advisor to, to figure out those itineraries and book so yeah g adventure is another trusted great brand i would go on one of those trips i several people in our organization have and um that's on my list too yeah, absolutely. I've actually done a trip with G Adventures and you really do feel like, you know, they're supporting the local communities. They don't bring you to any chains or anything like that. Everything is really local, really authentic, really great experiences, very unique. So, yeah. Yeah, this trip that I'm on in wine country in Sonoma in California actually includes a component like that where we are um, rescuing unharvested fruit and vegetables that then go to a meal program for people who need, need food, people who are hungry. So um, it's really, it it puts a whole other dimension into your trip. And and Mike and I, and you've talked about this before. um, And, and it's important for a lot of reasons, but it certainly does make you feel good too. Absolutely. And like I spoke about wellness um, on a previous episode, but, you know, part of wellness travel is also feeling good about yourself, feeling good that you're doing something good for the world and for people around you and communities around you. So the, you know, these types of trips where, you know, you're, you're traveling and traveling for good and, you know, giving your money to local communities and that sort of thing, you know, really does. Well, thank you. Yes. Thanks, Jessica. Thank you, Jessica. I know you had, You have a lot to choose from every week in terms of deals and promotions and specials, and and you apply your expertise to really bring us the finest. So we really appreciate it. Absolutely. Thanks for having me again, guys. Thanks, Jessica. Well, Mike, there's been some things in the news, huh? Yeah, there's been a lot of things in the news, and uh, a couple of things I wanted to share about um, kind of uh, some recent uh, travel experiences that I've had. Um, which were, I would say, a little bit unusual, to say the least. Um, but uh, coming back from Ireland just a couple of weeks ago now, 
Um, I was on a flight uh, with American Airlines, which is the airline I choose to fly with um, most of the time. And I've got uh, a, a status with them, so I get some extra perks and, and, and things. Um, but it was really unusual. I was on the flight, and this was about a, from um, – I was actually flying from Dublin, not Belfast, but from Dublin back to Charlotte. It's about an eight-hour flight, give or take. And um, after the flight took off, we had our meal service, and we were about two and a half hours into the flight. And the purser comes on, and the purser says, um, you know, uh, we've now completed our meal and beverage service, and uh, we're going to take a two and a half hour break. Uh, there's water and pretzels in the back of the plane, if you would like some. But basically, and he didn't say this, but just don't bother us for the next two and a half hours. And I thought that is um, that's pretty strange uh, and and very uncharacteristic of of an international flight crew. Um, so uh, for a third of the flight, uh, there were no flight attendants visible. Uh, and they were taking a break, and I guess they work two and a half hours, take a break two and a half hours, and then work the last two and a half hours on the on the flight. Yeah, it has to do with reduced crews, right? Because they used to carry enough crew to alternate on long flights, and um, they either can't get those people yet, or you know, it could be cost saving, but. Um, I've encountered it a few times myself. Yeah, and it's um, I, I just don't think on a on an U.S. based carrier you would find that. I don't think that would happen on most international carriers. So, a little bit disappointing uh, experience from American. Um, one other positive thing I want to tell you about was my experience with a company called Wise W I S E. And this is not a paid promotion either, but uh, I just want to tell you about uh, something that actually a friend of mine told me about. Um, and this is a, an app uh, that you can download, and it's W-I-S-E Wise. And it is a fintech solution. So it's a um, bank account, if you will. And you can load money into this bank account in U.S. dollars or whatever currency that you want to load it into. Um, and then they will send you a debit card. And then once you have this downloaded and you have money into the account, uh, which, by the way, this is a uh, – I believe Richard Branson, uh, this is one of his companies, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but you have the ability within the app to move currencies to another currency. So when I was in Belfast, as an example, actually when I was in Dublin, I moved some of my U.S. dollars into – um, euros because in Dublin they use the euro as the currency and I could do it on my uh, app and it cost maybe I think it was 39 cents to move 200 euros and I got a very favorable rate so then when I used my debit card in Dublin they charged my debit card in euros and I didn't get one of those marked up conversion rates and then as I went into Northern Ireland Ireland to Belfast, where the British pound is in, uh, is is used as the currency, I transferred money into the British pound. So then, when I used my debit card, it came out in British pounds. At the end of the trip, if I if I chose to do so, which I didn't, but I could reconvert all that back into U.S. dollars. So this is a great tool to travel, and I'm just really excited about this because it solves a lot of problems. Um, you know, in the travel business, we hear people: uh, Should I get my should I get currency converted in the U.S. before I go overseas? And almost always the answer to that is no, by the way, um, because the local banks here are not going to give you a, a favorable uh, exchange rate. Um, and even when you're in Europe, depending upon or in outside the U.S., when depending upon what type of credit cards you have, you may be subject to a conversion expense um, where they charge a service fee of one to one and a half percent on top of not a favorable um, conversion rate that you get when your charges in euros, as an example, get spilled back to your U.S. dollar credit card. So I know it's a little bit confusing, a little bit technical, but I really do suggest um, that you open up a WISE account or at least look into it. And um, the the conversion rates are, are great. The 
the commissions are very small and I, I now have on my phone five or six currency accounts. It, it's one centralized account, but you have accounts with um, each different currency in them. So really suggest you giving that a try, James. Yeah, uh, you've mentioned it, and I'm going to look into it. I mean, the one thing that I do when I get in destination is I go to a local bank uh, and uh, either withdraw money from their ATM or use the local bank to make the change. Rather than going to one of these change bureaus, they give you very unfavorable rates. But a bank, a bank will give you a market competitive rate, but you have a more sophisticated solution here, and I'm definitely going to look into it. What else has been going on uh, in the sort of insider industry news, Mike? I know we had one or two things we thought we could share. Yeah, um, a real interesting uh, article uh, came out this week from um, ACI Aero, and it revealed that the and I did not know this, and I bet this will be a surprise to you as well. That seven of the ten top busiest airports in the world, as a matter of fact, the seven top busiest airports in the world are all U.S. airports. And I would not have, I, I, I would have thought maybe we had one or two, but the likes of Heathrow or the likes of, um, uh, Tokyo, maybe even Singapore might have more traffic or more passengers, but actually the top seven airports in the world in terms of traffic are all based here in the U.S. Yeah, I, the top airport in terms of traffic is usually whatever airport I'm at at the moment, <laughs> at the yeah. moment. but yeah, I, I, uh, I hear you. Yeah, so um, it's Atlanta. Just just for our listeners, it's Atlanta's number one, um, Dallas is number two, Denver's three, Chicago's four, Los Angeles is five, Charlotte, believe it or not, is six, and Orlando is seven. And then it goes into a couple of uh, Guangzhou, Chengdu, uh, both in uh, China, and then Vegas is number ten. Uh, yeah, the New, New York area is a little misleading because we have three major airports. This is where I live, and we have three major airports that serve the area. So the traffic gets split between three airports, you know. This is you just being jealous that the number one airport's in the south. That, no, that's really, you, that can, <laughs> you can have the airport with the highest traffic. I'm very happy to allow that to be somewhere else. Oh, uh, yeah. But yeah, that's uh, very interesting, uh, in my opinion. Um, one other uh, report, uh, and, and this is actually a fact, that Hong Kong, um, as James, as you know, they've just recently reopened up for looking for tourists to come in. And um, prior to the pandemic, they would have around 55, 56 million visitors a year. And they've basically been shut down for two years now. Um, and so they're, they're taking very significant steps to bring tourists back. Um, and they are offering 500,000 free airline tickets to bring the tourists back to, um, to Hong Kong. So, uh, if you've, if you're interested in going to Hong Kong, um, now might be a good time to do it because they're giving away half a million free airline tickets. And and I think what they did is they pre-purchased um, airline tickets or airline credits from the airlines, probably as part of the government support of the airlines being basically shut down Cathay yeah. Pacific. Um, and so they, they have, I guess, rather than giving them money, they pre-bought tickets. And now that's they're going to use that uh, currency in a self-serving way, but a positive self-serving way of giving away airline tickets. So um, if you're interested, you can just Google uh, Hong Kong free airline tickets, and uh, that should take you to a link that will give you the information on how to qualify for those. Um, you'll be surprised to hear me focus on this, but Hong Kong is one of the great food destinations of the world. <laughs> Also, it is. I mean, it is considered to have some of the most sophisticated cuisine in the world. 
Um, and uh, there are, uh, you know, incredible dining opportunities, both, you know, very, very high end and super luxurious, but also affordable. You know, there's just really great food in Hong Kong amongst all the other reasons to go there. Yeah, that's a great place for uh, street food in Hong Kong as well. Um, very interesting uh, destination. All right, Mike. I think we've come to the end of our time for this episode, but uh, we should mention that we have a giveaway going on, and it is for a three-night stay uh, on property at Universal Parks and Resorts in Orlando. And um, that's I mean, that has to be worth $750,000 just for the hotel stay. And we're giving it away. Yes. Uh, but it's based, it's based on a question. So uh, each week we ask a question. You have to go to our website, notouristallowed.com, and answer the question correctly. And that gives you, is it five entries in the drawing? Mike? It gives you yes five entries. So if you go to first, you have to register. So if you'll go to notouristallowed.com, dot com, if you'll scroll to the bottom of our homepage, you'll see information about the contest. Please read all the rules, and then you can enter there. Once you enter, you're going to get two. Um, we're going to drop your name in the hat two times. You can refer a friend. You get uh, a few more entries. You can subscribe to our podcast, which we suggest you do, and you get five entries. And then also, if you'll answer the mystery question of the day, which James is going to provide you in just a second, uh, and you correctly answer, it's not just answering it because anybody can answer it, but if you correctly answer it, then you will gain five additional entries into our contest. And these will uh, accumulate. And if you're a, a weekly listener, like I know a lot of you guys are, um, you'll have a greater and greater chance of being the winner of the prize. So, um, James, why don't you take it away with our question? Sure. Well, Graham McKenzie uh, from Travel Mole was with us today uh, as our special guest, of course. And he had a number of surprises for us. But uh, let me let me pick one. What was Graham McKenzie's favorite hotel brand, not an individual property that he mentioned, but a hotel chain or a hotel brand that he mentioned as his favorite hotel experience. And you can't miss this one, guys, because he brought it up about three times. So um, you would have thought he was a paid endorser. <laughs> so uh, that's a that's an easy one. But thanks for that, James. Um, and thank you, listeners. We really appreciate um, all the positive feedback we've gotten. Um, also, if you have some things that J you would like James and I to cover, you can go to No Tourist Allowed, uh, go to the Contact Us page, and then you could submit your ideas, and uh, we'll uh, hopefully be able to cover some of those that come in. But we really do appreciate you listening, and uh, please stay tuned, uh, and we will have another podcast out for you next week. Yeah, thank you, everybody. Thank you for listening to No Tourists Allowed. No Tourists Allowed was produced by the Greenville Podcast Company. See you next week for another episode. Mm -hmm.